One of the things we've talked about over the last, just last week we started this series, is that really what we do in life flows from who we think we are. And so the truth is you can go your whole life and chase, chase the fruit, you can chase the symptoms, or you can go to the source and begin to address your identity. I want to encourage you to stick close this morning. If you have a cell phone, just hold it up for me like this right now. Um, just go ahead and hold it up. I want to encourage you, if there's something's on the screens, take a picture of it. I'm going to give you to you guys today, in hopefully 35 minutes, um, the equivalent of probably about a year of Bible school theology. Um, and there's a reason for it. It's not gonna, hopefully it won't be boring. I'm a little bit of an ADD weirdo, and so we'll keep it interesting. But you're going to get a lot of theology. I encourage you, if you see something that, kind of like, oh, that's it, snap a picture of it. Um, and then actually, if you, your fear person is like, hey, I need to go back and rehearse that again, you can go back, watch it online later. It's on, the, on our website. It's on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to try to only say things once because my, you guys don't tell me this. You're always like, your sermon was great. Karen says, you repeated that like eight times. And so that's why I talk a long time. So I'm going to try to say things once and keep moving. So I'm going to encourage you, you may need to go back and listen, and then it'll still be like you got an hour-long sermon only it'll be without me. So anyway, um, so I encourage you that if you go on our website even, my notes that I wrote, you can actually see how close I stayed to my notes. You can get these, and if you go, I want to read through that. There's a lot of content this morning, but we're going to try to move briskly through it. I want to start with a true story. Years ago, uh, the names of this have been changed to protect the guilty, but um, I was a youth pastor at our church, and there was a, a family that attended, and they had like a neighbor, and, and they were concerned about their neighbor's son. He was 16 years old, and he was getting into some trouble, and you know, the kind of trouble you get into when you're 16, and he was really struggling. He was kind of unhappy, and, and like even seeing doctors and stuff, and, and the parents were really worried, um, and they didn't know how to get through to him. And this person that went to our church, as, as all great people do, volunteered me to fix the problem. Like, professionals couldn't do it. Let's see what Bob can do. And so they remembered that I told a lot of stories about the fact that I used to box. And you guys have probably heard a story or two about that. Um, and so, so, and just so that you know, I was never good at it. I just did it. Um, anyway, and so, so I, I used to box. And so this kid was interested in boxing. And so they asked me, like, would you be willing to take him down to the boxing club and hang out with him one night a week? So I started this practice. This kid wasn't interested in church. And so I'd hang out with him at the boxing club. And I actually started boxing, which led to my only, uh, my coaching boxing has led to my only win I ever had, which was, I'm glad I did it. So anyway, um, and so, so I was taking this kid one night a week, hanging out. We really kind of connected. I, I love this kid. He was a, a bright young man, good looking, strong, um, you know, life ahead of him, but he was just struggling with life. And, um, and through the course of our friendship, he started attending the youth service on Wednesday nights that I led. And I remember this one particular Wednesday night. Man, worship's going, people are excited. And it was kind of like this morning, like people are just raising their hands and they're just really getting in the presence of God. And there's this moment I look over at this kid. His name's George, it's a fake name. Um, and and I, I make eye contact with him and I can see by the look on his face that he wants to talk like right now. And so I'm like, all right, I kind of motion for the back and we step out in the back and everything's still going on. You can hear the music in the background. We're in the hallway outside the service. And he says, I, I think I, I really want to give my life. I really want to be a Christian. I've decided. You know, I'm miserable, I'm not, whatever else, but I, I want to be a Christian. Maybe Jesus is the answer. And I'm so excited. I've been praying for this moment. I've been hanging out with this kid for months, getting punched in the face, all kinds of stuff. And, and, and so I start to kind of talk him through what it means to be a Christian, about repentance and forgiveness and all of this stuff. And, and as I'm talking about, like, repentance and what it really means, I see, like, a troubled look on his face. And he goes, well, I mean, here's the thing, Bob. I want to be realistic. Like, I'm 16. Like, I'm going to continue to party and, like, you know, all the stuff that happens at parties and hook up. And I mean, like, I, 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 I have a life going here, and I can't really, like, change that. I can't be a weirdo. Like, like I, I, that's going to continue, but God will forgive me of that, right? And, and I'm sitting here, and I'm having this. And so I try to walk him through again. I try to explain, well, here's what repentance means. It means I stop being my own God. I stop deciding, and I put my life in Jesus' hands. Now, God does forgive sin, but we have to tur turn over our will to him and say, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And, and so I'm trying to be a good salesman. I'm like, now that's what you want to do, right? And, and he kind of explains it all to me again. And he's like, but I'm going to continue to do this. 
And so we're back and forth, and I'm re-explaining repentant heart every way I can. And we finally come to the understanding, you're, you're unhappy, and your life isn't working, but you're not ready to surrender your life to Jesus. You're not looking to give anything up. You're looking just for something that you can add on to make it better. And that's not what it is to follow Jesus. And it was such a heartbreaking moment. And my, I honestly, like for years, I struggled over that conversation. And I was like, did I make a mistake? Should I have just pretended and just said, yeah, come on, we'll figure it all out later? <laughs> and, and I really, for years, kind of thought back about George and, and wondered, like, what, did I do something wrong? But, but here's the, the, just the plain truth. The forgiveness of God follows sincere repentance and surrender. And so that really wasn't where he was at, and it broke my heart to decide that. But what this kid wanted was he wanted Jesus, but he didn't want to walk away from anything he had built. And here's the reality. I tell his story because that's some of us, and some of us are in other places, and we'll get to that in a minute. But that, that all of us struggle to understand how sin and forgiveness and who we are in Jesus all really fits together. Like, how does this all fit together? How are we forgiven? Why does our sin matter? How does following Jesus really kind of... And so, so that's the whole thing. The question we're going to answer today is pretty big. We'll, we'll get through it, though. How does sin play into our identity as Christians? How does sin affect who we are in Jesus? And so quickly, I want to highlight three ways that we tend to think about sin ourselves, okay? So first of all, it was like this kid, George, okay? Some of us wallow in our sins. And we just tell ourselves, I'm just a yeah, human or sinner. How many of you guys have ever said, well, I'm just a sinner? I'm just a sinner, Bob. I mean, this is, this is just who I am. This is how I've always been. God forgives. Nobody's perfect. How many of you guys say that? Like, like nobody's perfect and we're not even trying, okay? And so anyway, I'd be like, nobody's perfect. But here's the thing, when you're, quote unquote, just a sinner, uh, when that's our identity, what we tend to do is abuse grace. We, we actually use forgiveness of God as a license to just go on sinning and doing whatever we want to do. And here's, here's the catch is that we're not really expecting or experiencing any kind of transformation. Like, we don't expect to be transformed by God. We only want to be forgiven by God. And so here's the thing. Forgiveness is real, but it's not the whole picture. And so we've got an incomplete picture of who we are as a Christian as it pertains to sin. And then, so that's this side of the spectrum, that I'm just a sinner. And here's the whole other side of the spectrum of error. And then what happens on this other end is that we become kind of self-deluded and self-righteous. Does anyone know anyone like that? Like they, just, they have no idea how terrible they are, you know? And it's like when we're self-deluded and self-righteous, we don't recognize the degree and the depth of our own sinfulness. And so, so when we think about sin... And when we think about sinners, we always think that's someone out there. That's where the sinners are. Like, like when, when the Bible talks about sin, or even when a pastor talks about sin, our mind immediately jumps to who else should have been hearing this. And I'm going to be real careful because I'm stepping on lots of our toes here. But there's a lot of us, when we hear a sermon, you go home, you're like, oh, I wish so-and-so would have been there to hear that. That's self-righteousness. Because the, the, the Bible always confronts our sin. It can't confront anyone else's sin through us before it ever confronts our sin, and we grow to meet it. That's that whole thing Jesus said about take the plank out of your own eye before you try to adjust the speck in someone else's. And so there's this other end where we're just clueless about what a hot mess we are. And so we might give lip service and say things like, well, I'm not perfect, but... I'm almost there. Like, that's what we mean. When people say, like, well, I'm not perfect, but, I mean, I've pretty much got it worked out. I mean, like, honestly, I'm, I'm like 90% there. You know, there's a few little things left that need some tinkering, 
but I'm doing all right. And in this era of identity, the lack of humility that we have, it, it, it makes us unable to see what we really are. And we have no idea where we really are spiritually. And here's the problem with self-righteousness, is that it's actually pride and it's arrogance. And here's what the Bible says about pride. It says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so when that's our place, when we're immediately jumping to how other people are actually the sinners and we're on the good team, us versus them, we're God's team, we're not team sinner, like when that's our perspective, then God is like constantly, you don't realize it, but God's doing like talk to the hand, right? When we turn to him, he's like, <laughs> you need to fall on your face a few more times, right? And we're actually opening ourselves up to struggle and suffering because we force God to have to humble us. And so, so that's the challenge is that when we're self-righteous, God loves us too much to leave us that way. And he'll humble us, right? And not only does God resist the proud and the self-righteous, but other people don't care for it much either. And so then when we're self-righteous, we paint a very, very gross picture of Jesus for the world around us. And people are like, yeah, I mean, I don't really want to go to hell, but I don't want to become what that person's like. Nobody, nobody likes them. <laughs> Right? And so there's this end of the spectrum, there's I'm just a sinner, then there's self-righteous, and then there's this other thing that's kind of in between these and actually ping-pongs back and forth between them, and this is how I grew up. This is what I'm going to call circumstantial righteousness. And what that means is that we feel really righteous when we're doing good in the moment, okay? So like, like when we haven't cussed out any nuns in a while, we're like, dude, I'm awesome. Like, I'm on God's hit squad, man. I'm one of David's mighty men. I'm ready to go. I'm for real righteous. But then, inevitably, bad times always come. Like, maybe you fall back into some sin or some sinful pattern that you thought you were past, and you're like, where did this even come from? Or you go through a season of spiritual numbness or distance in your life, and you struggle to maintain any kind of spiritual connection to God, and in those moments, you feel worthless. And so what develops then is this kind of roller coaster spirituality where you're righteous for like a day, and then something happens, and then you're worthless. And then you're down on yourself and horrible and I'm terrible, and then you really kind of get your gumption together. You're, I'm sick of being worthless, and I'm going to do all kinds of things to make myself righteous. And then you're back up here, and you're righteous for a minute. And then, like, your wife looks at you funny, and you lose your temper, and then you're worthless again, right? Whatever it is, and you're just back and forth, up and down. And if you grew up in church, like, like, raise your hand if you grew up in church, like, all the time. Like, that's probably how you grew up, all right? And there is a high level of trauma from that, and we get angry at the church for that. Sometimes we think the, the church broke us, but the truth is we just don't really understand the gospel. And so we have to understand the gospel and sin and our righteousness, and it'll set us free from, from all three of these and every other thing that's on that spectrum. And so none of that it really meshes with the scriptural picture that's painted of your identity in Christ. And so what we're going to do for the next, you know, I, I think I still have 35 minutes. We just started. Um, what we're going to do for the next 35 minutes, I'm just kidding. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to just go through the scriptural pictures of what your identity actually is in regards to sin and righteousness. And so, um, so in regards to sin and righteousness, who are you really? And here's the answer. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, I love this word, not but, but and. And, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Here's the reality. All human beings sin and fail to meet the standard of the glory of God. All of us. We were created for more than what we live out. It's just the truth. You were, I was, we were all created for more. We function at a level less than what we were created to be. We are not what we ought to be. You are not what you ought to be. I am not 
what I ought to be. And that verse says, though, that we're justified. So it says, this is true. You're not what you ought to be. And you're justified. And that word justified is an interesting one. It actually means to, like, pronounce one to be righteous. And, and pronounce is like declare, like a judge declaring this is so. So, you, so it's saying that we're, we're declared to be righteous. And another way that was translated is to be declared to be as we ought to be. So our sin makes us not what we ought to be. And yet somehow God declares us through Jesus to be as we ought to be. And here's the interesting and powerful thing. Because like sometimes we just say, like, oh, yeah, like, you know, she's funny or he's funny. They may not really be funny, right? How many of you guys have ever told a lie to be nice? Like, oh, was it good? It was awesome. Right? How do I look in this? Wonderful, right? Whatever it is, like we tell lots of nice things sometimes. But God is not like us. He's not a human. That, and and, and the, it's not that he does lie. It's not, he's not a human that he can lie. Because here's what I mean. In the beginning, it says this in the book of Genesis. Some of you will be able to finish my sentence. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. It doesn't say in the beginning, God said, let there be light. So he lit a match. So he lit a candle. So he flicked on a lamp. It says, God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. So 100 billion nuclear explosions started happening, and they called it the sun, and it happened at the word of God. Let there be light. And so what this is saying is that in the same way God said, let there be light, and there was light, God said, you are righteous through Jesus. So in Jesus, you are righteous. Not because you did a bunch of stuff, you lit a candle, you turned on a lamp, you made yourself better, you learned how to curtsy, whatever, whatever it is. He said it, so it's now reality. And so that verse is telling us exactly who we are in regards to sin and righteousness. And here's the crazy thing, it's kind of a paradox. It's kind of like going in two opposite directions. So here's the truth that's telling us about ourselves. If you catch this today, hopefully you'll, you'll catch the biggest part, is that we are sinfully falling short, and we're declared righteous. We are sinfully falling short, and we are declared righteous. We're not as we ought to be because of our sin, yet somehow at the same time, Jesus declares us to be as we ought to be. And here's the interesting thing about biblical truths, is that biblical truths always feel or often feel like a contradiction. A biblical truth is often obtained by, by, by taking two different truths that feel like they're in, in opposite of each other, and then it's, it's created in the tension between those two Things. And here's why it works that way, because there's one reality that's true because of human limitations. So this is true. You are fallen. You are sinful. That's the human side of it. And then there's the but God side of it. That's beyond our control. It's beyond our comprehension. And so you have to hold on to this pole. Yes, I'm sin sinful. Yes, I'm fallen. But God and Jesus went to the cross and redeemed me. And now I'm righteous. And so as I hold on to both of these ideas without letting go of either one of them, then I begin to have a chance at understanding the real truth of God. It's in the tension between the two. Because of Jesus' substitutionary death and resurrection, you are not one or the other. You're not righteous or sinful. Somehow we are both sinfully falling short, and declared righteous through Jesus. So that's the reality of who you are today. And so now we're going to kind of go through what the implications of this are. Because this is true, here's how your life should be, okay? So in Jesus, we're sinfully falling short, but we're not under condemnation. And this is going to be life-changing for so many of you today. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no 
condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, then you are not under condemnation from God. That's something you just have to capture. Now, the idea of what is condemnation? Well, condemnation is that thing in us that says, like, you're horrible. You're worthless. You're dirty. You're a lost cause. You deserve everything bad that ever happens to you. How many of you guys have heard that voice before? Man, how many of you guys have repeated that voice back to yourself? And this is just who you are. You deserve everything bad. It's going to happen to you. Condemnation says you're hopeless. You're beyond grace or help. Yeah, they talk about God forgives, but none of them know what you do. None of them know who you are. None of them know what you've thought, what you've said, what you've seen. That's condemnation. Condemnation says that, that you might as well not even try because it's just a matter of time before everyone knows exactly how worthless you are and they're all done with you. Condemnation tells you God is done with you. You just haven't seen the evidence yet. You're basically in hell. You're just patting out the flames right now. Don't even worry about it. You're not going to make it. That's condemnation. And so if you're living under condemnation or in those moments you're experiencing condemnation, I want you to know it's not God that's speaking that into your soul. That's a trick of your enemy, Satan. That's the enemy. And when you're playing that playlist in your head, you're hitting repeat on his stuff, not on God's stuff. All right? Like, I used to love to run a lot, and I still run, but I don't love to. And so, um, and so I used to have this song that I would play, like, I need a hero. And I'm like, I could run up a hill with the wind blowing at me and the rain. If that song is playing, I can do anything. He's got to be strong, and he's got to be fast. He's got to be fresh from the, I'm fresh from the fight. Right? And so I could... But it's a whole other thing. Can you imagine trying to run listening to, Hello, darkness, my old friend. Come to talk to you again. <laughs> you can't do it. You're like lay down in the middle of the road. Does that do now? <laughs> right? Guys, condemnation, you got to change the playlist. You got to go, no, that's not what reality is. How many of you guys have seen Star Wars and you know those things called the AT Walkers? Anybody know an AT Walker? It stands for all-terrain walker and they kind of look like this. Those things are indestructible. Those things are scary. Those things are deadly. You cannot shoot them. They have too much armor. You cannot blow them up. You cannot stop them. They just rain down death and destruction, right? Nobody can stop them. If you, it doesn't matter if you have a lightsaber, if you have 10 lightsabers or anything else. If you come up against an AT walker, you're done for. Unless you trip it, right? <laughs> Unless an Ewok stretches a vine across where you're going to walk and then, boom, like face down on the ground. And then an Ewok comes over with a slingshot boom, into the head and somehow it all blows up. You're like, they're all dead in there now. Or, or unless like some little tiny speeder comes around with a cable and wraps it around the legs and they're like, rrr, rrr, rrr. I, I was going to totally fall on my chin this morning. I'm just recovering from an illness next time. Anyway, um, and so, so that's what happens right? They're completely, like, dominant until you get them down on the ground. And that vine, that cable that trips up that AT walker, that's, that's condemnation for us. Listen to me. When you know who you are in Jesus, you're dangerous. When you know that your sin isn't held against you anymore, that you're the righteousness of God, you're dangerous. You're dangerous to the enemy. You're dangerous to hopelessness. You're dangerous to depression and sadness. You're dangerous to everything broken in the world around you. But all it takes is a little condemnation to get tangled up in your feet. And you start to think, if they only knew, I'm just this, I'm just that. And immediately you're on your chin on the ground and you've been brought low. And that's all Satan needs to take you out is a little bit of condemnation. And so when we start hearing condemnation and rehearsing it in our head, we have to know that's not from God. 
Here's the, the theology and the reality of this. If you're a Christian, God actually already condemned your sin in Jesus on the cross. Your sin's already been condemned, and God is just, and he doesn't condemn the same sin twice. Your sin's already been judged. It's already been condemned. It's already been confined to the pit of hell, and it happened in Jesus' body on your behalf. So when you start to hear that condemnation, you guys say, no, no, I'm not, I'm not paying for this a second time. Jesus already paid for this. I don't have to listen to this. I'm hitting skip in this song. I'm going to the next playlist. I'm stepping out of this little trip wire here. I'm not going to fall for this condemnation. There's such freedom when we really begin to grasp who we are in Jesus as it relates to our sin. Listen, God doesn't feel that way about you. When you start rehearsing that stuff, you got to catch it. Like, that's not how God feels. That's not how God feels. I'm rehearsing my enemy's lines back to myself. He has set me free from condemnation. And I'm not going to let that wrap around my feet anymore. Now, the next question we're going to answer is, does freedom from condemnation equal Freedom to sin. And here's where we kind of get messed up. We go from one end of the spectrum to the other end. We're like, I'm free! Let's see what we can get away with, right? And so then we kind of go the other direction. But 1 Corinthians 10, I won't read it. I'm just going to summarize it for you. It warns us not to do this. It says, don't set your hearts on evil things. And then it tells us a story from Israel's past as an example. So Israel was in slavery in Egypt. God shows up to deliver them. There's the 10 plagues. Remember those stories? Crazy. God decimating the Egyptian empire. God showing all of their power and all of their gods to be nothing. Delivering the Israelites, protecting them even among the plagues. They come out. Now they're, they're in the desert. They're being shielded by his presence in the form of a cloud during the day. Fire at night. They're being kept warm. They're eating miracle bread called manna that's coming from heaven every day. There's a million people out there at least, and they're drinking water that's just miraculously coming out of rocks. And then Pharaoh and his chariots are chasing them. God opens up the Red Sea and parts it. They walk across on dry ground, and they're being chased. And they look back, and they go, uh-oh. And then the Red Sea collapses collapses and crushes Pharaoh and all of his chariots. And so, so God's talking about, here's all I did for all these people. They were under my care. They were under my protection. They were under my blessing, but they were idolatrous. Like even when, like the next couple of days, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to get the law. They're already making idols down below, and they've committed themselves now. Like, we got, our own, we got this covered. We're going to have a little gross party down here, right? If you're a grown-up, you can read it. But it's pretty gross, right? And they made some idols. They did some gross stuff. Because their hearts, they decided in their hearts, like, this is what we're just going to do. Like, like, this is just our time. Like, I'm just 16, and this is just what 16-year-olds do. Like, this is what we're going to do. They set their hearts on wickedness. They didn't fall into sin. They knowingly walked into sin time after time after time. They wanted God's covenant provision. They wanted God's protection. They wanted God's blessing, but they didn't intend to live up to their side of the covenant. They thought this was one-sided. They thought they had a genie and a lamp, not a God who wanted to live in covenant with them. But that's not how a covenant works. And so here's what happened. Long story short, that generation wandered for 40 years in the wilderness rather than walking into the promised land, and they died in the desert. And their kids got to experience what they should have because they set their hearts on evil. And it turns out, just to kind of give you the, the summation here, it turns out that God is not okay with a one-sided covenant where he's the only one that's into you. Like, you know, like, ah, well, maybe you love me enough for the both of us. It's not how, it's not how it works. And so then Corinthians 10, it tells us something interesting. It says that, that what happened to them, it didn't happen for our benefit. It says it was recorded for our benefit so that we don't fall into the same trap. So God made sure that whole thing was written down so you could read it and go, oh, God's not okay with this kind of thing. So our covenant with God is predicated on our repentance and surrender. 
It's, that's, that's first base. I have to surrender to God. As long as repentance and surrender are my heart and my mindset, then God lavishes grace to cover our sin. You, I mean, you, you can't fail enough for him to run out of grace. He's like, boosh, 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 grace, grace here, boosh, grace there. And you're like, oh my gosh, grace, right? Like he, he just pours it out to cover our sin as long as our heart, our mindset is repentance and surrender. But when we decide, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do, like regardless of what God's word says, in that moment, we're displaying a very different heart. And I just want to be really clear, that posture puts us in a perilous place spiritually. And that was the warning of 1 Corinthians 10. That's the warning. Like you don't want to put yourself in that place. That's a perilous place to be with God. Repentance and surrender is our posture. And in, re and in response to that, you get endless grace. Now, freedom from condemnation, we just discovered this, we just talked about this, it doesn't mean that we're free to sin, but it, it does mean that we're freed from sin so that we can be a new creation. So here's what God thinks about this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and, every and the new is here. Everything is new. That's what God sees when he looks at you. You're a new creation. All the old is gone. Everything is new. The forgiveness and mercy of God means that everything that was terrible about you is just no longer true as far as God's concerned. I want you to practice something with me. I want you to think about something really terrible that you've done. Take a minute. Raise your hand when you got it. Okay, and I'm talking bad stuff. Stuff that, not stuff that you're like, yeah, ha, ha. Like, how many of you guys have those kind of things that you admit are false to other people just to placate so you don't have to talk about the serious stuff? You know what I'm saying? So when you got yours, raise your hand. The message of 2 Corinthians 5.17 is, is this. That just isn't true about you anymore. You're a new creation. Everything old is gone. And all things have been made new. That's just not true about you anymore. That's not who you are. Scripture says that the mercies of God are new every single morning. That every morning God is pouring out his mercy on you again. That means your past failures, they just don't have a hold over you the way that you think they do. So in other words, you're not just a liar, okay? Is anyone in here a liar? Raise your hand. We, we won't believe you if you do, but, um, and so anyway, you're not just a liar. You're not just an angry person. You're not just a whatever it is, fill in the blank that you've accepted is true about you. You're not the sin that you fell into yesterday. You're not the sin that you fell into for a hundred yesterdays. You're a new creation. The old is gone and everything is new. Living in the light of yesterday's failures is like starting off a game of chess with one piece left and already in check. Picture that. Your, your enemy has all their pieces. You're in check. You've got just your king. How long is that game going to last? One move. It's going to go from check to checkmate, and it's over. That's what we're doing to ourselves when we accept these sins as part of who we are. Like, I'm just at this. I'm just, you're starting off in check. You're going to fail. You're going to lose every single time. But, you are the righteousness of God that is displayed in Christ Jesus. That's who you are in God's sight. And that is the identity that you're supposed to be living in response to. And when you do that, your board is full every morning. That's who you are. That's what God says you are. And that's how you proceed through your day. So in light of our true identity, how should we respond to our sin? That's, that's the next question. When, when we do sin, when we face temptation, how do we respond now because of this? When we recognize that we have sinned, the Bible says we should respond with what's called godly sorrow. 
in repentance. Everyone say godly sorrow. We're going to talk about this for about two minutes because I want you to know the difference between godly sorrow and condemnation. Because sometimes we think we're experiencing godly sorrow when we're letting condemnation be heaped on us. 2 Corinthians 7 teaches us that believers should experience godly sorrow. If you grew up churchy, anybody grow up churchy here? Then you grew up calling this the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is a great word. It's conviction, right? And so when you're experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're experiencing godly sorrow. See, there's a kind of sorrow that comes when we recognize that we are living out of our old self rather than living out of the new creation that we are. And this is different than condemnation. This kind of sorrow flows from a love for God, not a fear of God. This flows from a recognition of who I actually am. It flows from a genuine desire to please God. It doesn't run from God. It draws near to God. Godly sorrow is like, Father, I'm sorry. Dad, I I, I did it. Thank you for your grace, Father. This isn't, I know this isn't who I am. This sorrow flows from a really high view of who we are. Condemnation flows from a really low view of who we are. So godly sorrow flows from a high view of who I am, and I'm sorrowful because what I did flows from who I was, not from who I am. Do you see how that's different than condemnation? And so godly sorrow recognizes that we are who God says we are. We're a new creation. And so we're sorrowful when the reality of our life doesn't match who God declares us to be. And so when we experience godly sorrow, here's what happens. In that moment, you go, ooh, how many of you guys have felt godly sorrow? All right, anybody feel it already this morning? Yeah, so you you feel godly sorrow and you're like, ooh, Ooh, and then here's how you respond. You go, God, I accept your love for me and your grace. And then we hold on to who we are in him. I know that I'm a new creation. And so in response to that, I let go of the sinful action or pattern that doesn't match up. And that's repentance. Condemnation is the opposite. You feel sorrowful, and so you let go of who you were in him. Right? Right? So in this, you hold on to who you are in him and you let go of the sin or the pattern. And when we do that, Paul tells us to do this. He says, forget what's behind and strive toward what's ahead. You go, okay, yeah, I blew it. It wasn't smart. Here's who I am. I acted out of who I was. So I'm going to forget that and I'm going to keep moving towards what is ahead because his grace is enough for me. And that is how we respond after we've sinned, and we're almost done now. So, um, so but, but, but really quickly, how do we respond before we sin? Right? It, because is temptation and is sin inevitable? And sometimes we believe it is. And so I wanted to read this before we finish. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted... He'll also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You see, temptation, I want to say this, does not indicate low moral character. That is a trick of Satan that will get you to fall for temptation. How many of you guys have ever felt bad that you were tempted to do something? And you were embarrassed, like like I'm embarrassed to say that I'm tempted to do this thing or that thing. Temptation does not display low moral character. Condemnation tricks you into feeling bad even just for being tempted. And that verse is saying that all are tempted by essentially the same things. So here's the reality. When you're tempted, here's what you have to know. If I'm dealing with this, everyone deals with this. Whatever it is, if I'm dealing with this, everyone deals with this because that's what the Scripture says. That means like the leaders in the church, Pastor Bob, Karen, like especially Karen, like whatever it is, like, I'm just kidding, she... We'll talk later. Anyway, um, <laughs> we won't, but we will. Anyway, um, according to this verse, here's what I want you to know. Sin is not inevitable. God provides a way of escape. That's what it said. Like, if, if there's a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. 
God provides like an ejector seat. God doesn't send temptation, but when temptation's come in your way, he slips a little ejector seat in there. And so if you're watching for it, there's a way out. How many of you guys have ever, be honest, you were, you were in a situation where you were being tempted to do something bad, and then a person who represents goodness in your life called on your cell phone in that moment. Raise your hand. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. It's like, okay, that's God saying, shut up. All right, how's it going? <laughs> right? There's so many times where it's like, if I'm watching for it, there's the ejector seat. Right? But here's the thing. Like, if you're in a plane that's going down, you're not trying to endure that. You're not like, I think I can take it. <laughs> I think when I hit this ground and this steering wheel is pushed this way at 800 miles an hour, I think I can take it. But that's what we do when we stay in temptation situations where we go, you know what? I think I got it now. Go ahead. Do your worst. And we just stay in the circumstance and think we're going to continue to resist. And that verse doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you're going to resist. It says God makes a way out so that you can escape it. If you stay there, you're going to crumble but you escape, and that's how you overcome temptation. You watch for the way out. You feel the pressure of the temptation. You go, this is my moment. I'm exiting now. Thank you, Lord, for the way out of this situation, right? I want to invite the band to come back. Listen, every time, this is crucial. This is where growth comes, so I want you to hear this. Every time we escape temptation, we weaken it in our life. Every time you just give in to temptation, you strengthen it in your life. And it owns you a little bit more, and it owns you a little bit more. Every time you resist, every time you pull the escape hatch and you escape, it owns you less. And it becomes a little bit less of this grueling thing, this taskmaster in your life. Right? Every time we escape temptation, our identity as a new creation becomes a little more real to us. You see, right now, when I, if I told you to say this, I am not, I'm not just a sinner. I am a new creation. You would probably blush as you said it. You're like, no, I don't. <laughs> it's not true because you don't know what, yet, you know. But the thing is, is as you grow in this way, the more you resist, the more you escape temptation, the more that reality becomes actually true on the ground in your life. I want you to know it was already true from God's perspective because he declared it, and it's so. You are a new creation. It's already been true from his perspective. But as you grow in this way, what's happening is it's becoming more true now in our experiences. And so what happens is now our actual life becomes freer and richer and fuller. That means your marriage gets better. That means your friendships get better. That means your interaction with your kids get better. That means your finances get better because you're not in bondage to all these things. That means everything gets better because you're growing. That new creation is becoming more true in reality. So here's what I want to do. We're actually... Uh, we're leaving this on the screen for a minute. If you're not a person that has a phone that takes pictures, um, you should check it out sometime. It's pretty cool. Anyway, um, I'm just being silly. There's little cards on that black wall there um, that, that have this written out. If you're a cell phone picture and you want to just take a picture, uh, I, I encourage you to do that. But take a picture of that. That's the, the summation of everything we talked about this morning. Here's what's true about you. You are sinfully falling short and... You're made righteous. That's what's true about you. You are sinfully falling short, and you are made righteous. The next thing is that just a sinner is not who we are. That is not who we are. It's an incomplete picture. Who you are is, yes, you're sinfully falling short, but you are made righteous eternally in God's sight, but also increasingly as we learn to flesh it out like we just talked about. We're not powerless against temptation. But in the times that we do fall, we do not sink into condemnation. We do not sink into condemnation. Some of you are going to have to look at that tomorrow. You're going to start hearing that stuff in your head. And you're going to have to go, no, I don't sink into condemnation. Even when we're sinfully falling short, through the grace of God, 
we're made righteous. We're declared righteous. In the same way he said, let there be light, and there was light, he said, you are made righteous in Jesus. I want you to stand. I'm just going to speak these verses over you, and then we're going to finish in a song together. But this is just kind of a bunch of the verses we've been talking about for the last few minutes. And so I'm just going to kind of say this as a blessing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are declared righteous through Jesus. That can be you today. It, it, for many of you, it is you. If it isn't you right now, that can be you. All are made righteous in Jesus. Can I have that back real quick? Thanks. <laughs> or the other thing. Um, just a sinner is not who we are. Oh, that's right, we lost it. Um, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. All things are made new. That's who you are. All the old is gone. I'm going to say that again because I think someone needs to hear that again. Think about all the old, that stuff that we drudged up a minute ago. All the old is gone. It's gone. That's not who you are anymore. Everything has been made new. You are a new creation, and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's sing this song together.